Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> hey, the other day I was asked a question concerning tongues. I didn't want to answer it on Facebook because uh, it's a divisive question, but I'm going to set the record straight today on a lot of different things, you know. Uh, but before I do that, uh, let me just let me just say this. I have a lot of good friends on both sides, you know. Uh, this is not an issue for me that breaks fellowship. Okay. Now, if somebody tries to push certain what I believe to be unbiblical beliefs on me or people, I'm hey, I, I'm not going to allow it. Okay. No more than your pastor or people that are your shepherds or elders or whatever would allow that. Okay, in fact, I'm going to expose it, which I'm going to do today. Now, a lot of you that may have grown up in Pentecostal homes or charismatic homes or word of faith uh, uh, ministries, uh, I'm going to share some things with you that maybe you haven't thought about before. Okay, uh, but before I do that, I, I had shared a story on the last video that I did about this, about my Uncle Augustine, who was saved in Mexico, uh, was a pastor of a small mission in Lubbock, Texas, Abernathy to be exact, and a truck driver fell asleep uh, at the wheel and uh, broke his neck and left him a quadriplegic. And he had three sons at the time, little sons and his wife, and uh, anyway, uh, fast forward from there about a year, two years later, he's in his home and he's got some straps on his arms and that he used to exercise every day diligently for hours. Well, some pastors came over and decided they were going to pray with him. And they prayed, they believed in word of faith, name it, claim it call it into existence for him to get up out of this wheelchair and walk. Well, he didn't. And then they started accusing him of not having enough faith. Now, I didn't, I don't remember, I was an unbeliever at the time, but I sh shared this yesterday with one of his sons who is now in his 50s, Sammy Serta. And he told me something that I either forgotten or I can't remember. But he says, do you know that when that happened, my father told those men that God honors the faith of little children. And he says, my little son there, the youngest one, has been praying that his father would get up and walk. And I haven't. So the question of him not having enough faith was as, about as arrogant as can, you know, and they got up and left. Now, that was over 50 years ago. Since then, I've been exposed to this hundreds of times. And so even in my own life, people have come to me and said, hey, man, you have you received the Holy Spirit? I said, yeah. Well, when did you receive him? I said, when I got saved. Did you speak in tongues? Yeah, I've been speaking in tongues since I was a little boy, since I could talk. No, no, no. Did you speak in that angelic language that is special between you and God? I said, yeah, it's called prayer. I do it all the time. No, no, no. <laughs> That's not what they meant. I understood. Sometimes I'd be fetishious with them and i tease them about all that. But they got it all backwards. It's all reverse. And I'm going to, sh I want to share with you this morning what's really happening here. Okay. So if you look up on the board here, you have, you have, uh, um, charismatics, especially in this group, word of faith, Pentecostals. It was the difference between a charismatic and a Pentecostal. Well, Charismatics have no systematic theology. This one person was telling me about he got the baptism of the Holy Spirit and started speaking in tongues. And I said, well, when did that happen with you? 
He says, oh, about a year before I got saved. So they don't have any systematic theology. Okay, they go strictly by experience. Experience becomes their source of authoritative, uh, 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 from what God, they, they believe God is doing or saying. Pentecostals do have a systematic theology, okay, and, and they are pretty solid in a lot of areas except for the doctrine of pneumatology. What is pneumatology? It's the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Now, before we go any further, and I tell you, who is the Holy Spirit? He is the third person of the Trinity. You've got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Okay. When I put my trust in Christ, Ephesians says in, in chapter 1, in him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, not our will. Pay attention to that because when I get the word of faith movement. In order that we who were the first to hope of Christ might be for the praise of the glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So at the moment of salvation, Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. Pay attention to that word when we come to demonic possession. Okay, so the minute I put my trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit came in me, not partially, but as a person just like the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And he gave me the ability at that moment to do what I couldn't do before. And that was to resist temptation and to be obedient to him and to walk in faith, okay? Now, again, the Holy Spirit is a person. He didn't come in me partially or restrict it in any sense. You know, it's sort of like, I, I had somebody say to me, hey, Manny, uh, you received the Holy Spirit. I said, yeah, when I got saved. He says, well, you need to speak in tongues subsequent to your salvation. And that will empower you as you get slain in the Spirit. So I'm thinking to myself, you mean he comes after salvation? And he's going to empower me then, not when I got saved. And, and, and I kept thinking about that. And, and what's wrong with that picture? Something is very unbiblical about that. Okay, because their idea of power is that you're going to be empowered. And the Bible doesn't teach that. Okay, let me show you here. Here's the charismatics. If this circle represents the totality of the life, you are empowered, they say, when the Holy Spirit comes in you and you now have the ability to do things you didn't have before. In other words, that didn't happen when I got saved. That's what they're saying. Okay. And you know you do that when you're able to speak in tongues. And to that, that could be gibberish or what they call the language of angels, which is gibberish, what they say. Okay, what's wrong with this picture? Because that's not what the Bible teaches the Holy Spirit does. He doesn't empower you so that you can do more. He takes you out of the way so that he can do more. <laughs> this is the way. What Charismatic Pentecostals and everything have done, they have reversed what, was, what is really biblical. This is a disciple. This is you. The Bible says to be filled in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. Filling means you get out of the way as you're filled daily by doing three different things. Die in the self, giving up everything you have, and put in the Lord Jesus Christ first. In other words, what the Holy Spirit wants to do is get you out of the way so that he can do his thing through you. That's where he gets the glory. Not by you doing your thing. 
Okay. Now, the Bible says to grieve not the Holy Spirit and quench not. To grieve not means to have unconfessed sin in your life. Arrogance, ego, pride. I call this very much narcissism when they're looking to see what they can get out of God. Not what God can do for you and through you. Okay? So it also says to quench not. That's to resist his will. And it's very difficult to die every day, die daily, give up all you have, and for the complete opposite of this. See what Charismatics and Pentecostals, they're looking for something they can get so that they can brag about something they can do. Okay, it's all about them. Let me show you. First thing they say, and it's always the same, hey, the reason why they ask me that question, I get posed that question on Facebook all the time. Hey, Manny, have you received the Holy Spirit? In other words, they're implying, because I have what you don't. In other words, when I put my trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit didn't come in me. Not fully. Maybe just partially. So I feel like I'm in a room with my mom and dad and um, I'm in their presence and I'm, I'm saying to them, where's mom and dad? We're right here. <laughs> Or somebody at Christmas time is giving me a gift. And I say, well, when am I going to get my gift? We just gave it to you. You're looking for something you already have. They're trying to get you to seek something that you are in possession of. And that's the person and the personality of the Holy Spirit. The minute you got saved, he sealed you with himself. Not partially, but completely. And... In Romans, it tells that we have been enriched with every heavenly blessing at that moment. The problem is a lot of people don't know they have it, or they have it, and somebody convinces them they really don't have it. they got to go seek it with some kind of supernatural experience, which isn't true. Okay, second thing they say is, I can do what you cannot do because I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, subsequent speaking in tongues, so I ask them, okay, what can you do that I cannot? And they say a number of things. One, we have a secret prayer language. Really? How does that work? Well, we speak in this unknown language that only God understands. Really? Give me a demonstration of that. And I've heard it before. I don't know if I would give you about it. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself as I read about all the prayers in the Bible the prayer that the mother of Jesus prayed intelligent, eloquent scriptural all the prayers of the Psalms you know the prayers of Peter and Paul the prayers of Jesus I don't see anything like that they were really deep felt thoughts or questions or ponderings that went to God, which was clearly understood within the person praying. Well, we were praying a way that only God can understand, and we don't know how to pray as Jesus did. That's true. But you learn as you grow. Okay, you learn to pray according to his will, not yours. So, what can they do that I can't? Pray, no, all my prayers will get answered, okay? God either answers my prayer or he doesn't answer it uh, with a wait or he gives me a reason as to why he's not going to or he's going to. And, but all my prayers are answered because he gave me that promise that make your request known to God with thanksgiving. And he, he gives us all these things coming. He's not like that unrighteous judge that you got to go and bang and plead and tarry for in order to get an answer. Okay? He, he's a gracious God that wants to answer your prayers. No different than any child with their father or mom. You know, you go to them, you talk to them, you have a conversation with them. 
That's what prayer is. Okay, whether it be a confession or petition, you know, or intercession. Well, we got wisdom that you don't because God gives us this special insight. Really? In James it says, any of you that lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men without reproach, generously. He didn't say you have to go do something first before you get that. Well, it helps us to overcome heroin addiction and alcoholism, and it gives us this power to resist. Oh, you have that that I don't? The minute he gave me a new nature, when I put my trust in Christ, he gave me the ability to make a choice that reflects him. Okay? When they talk about power, especially in Acts 1, that word translated is really the ability. You're now going to take on a new nature, his nature, where you're going to be able to reflect his character, his choices, and his purposes. It's a matter of the will, okay? Whether you want to obey or disobey, or you're trying to look for some supernatural help, you know? The greatest help that you can get is the Word of God and encouragement from other believers that will lift you up in those moments. What do you think encouragement means? It means to put courage into somebody to do the right thing before God at a difficult time. Well, we can overcome things, really. The Bible says that I am an overcomer. I just need to walk in that. What does the Holy Spirit do for me? He brings to memory, like right now. What am I doing right now? I'm exercising my spiritual gift. So who's doing it, me or the Holy Spirit? He uses me. He uses my, the gift. I didn't have this gift before I was saved. You know, I want to play ball. <laughs> but he gave me this desire to study. That has never left me. He gives me that desire. He gives me the gift. Why? What is the purpose of the gift of teaching? is to correct error, like I'm doing now. Maybe it is to teach certain things so that a person can be built up. It's for edification. Okay, so the gift is never for me. It's for the use of others. So i got to get out of the way and not teach what Manny wants to teach, but teach what the Word of God teaches. And the Holy Spirit does that through me. Okay, now how do I know whether or not this teaching is really of God or not? It's always based on the fruit of it. Because if you do something in the flesh, you're going to see the deeds of the flesh. But if you do something in the fruit, you're going to see the fruit of your teaching. People will be blessed. People will be encouraged. People will be strengthened. Okay, people will be challenged to do things they haven't done. I don't know how many people I ended up helping, you know, to go into ministry. Or to start studying the Bible on their own. You know, to quit being dependent on, on false teachers or teachers that are way out to lunch. Okay. Illumination. What is illumination? Illumination is giving you insight, discernment. First Corinthians says this. It doesn't say you have to be baptized in spirit, speak in tongues. It says all those that are his have the ability to discern what is right and wrong. It's not a matter of age, it's not a matter of gender. It's not even a matter of education. It's a matter of a right relationship with God through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now the Bible tells me I'm to be filled with the Holy Spirit, filling every day. What I was filled with today doesn't carry over tomorrow. Because we got three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Okay, so the idea that they come with this, I can, I have someone you don't, I can do something you can't, is about as arrogant as you can get, and it's very unbiblical. Okay, the biblical model of the role of the Holy Spirit is right here. If you notice, this is the way the Pharisees operated. This is the way the disciples operated. And one of the biggest problems with the Word of Faith movement and I'll explain that in a minute, and also with Pentecostalism and some of their teaching and charismatics, is they make it all about them. 
not on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's what they can get, not what God wants to do for them and through them. The greatest way to be used of God, and, and I'll talk about that as we're going to get into Philippians 2. Okay. Word of faith movement. What are they saying, in essence? First of all, if you understand and study the history of it, it's metaphysics. Okay, I think a guy by the name of Kenyon started then passing on to Kenneth Hagin, Copeland, and all that. And basically what they're saying is you can talk reality into existence by declare, I declare this. I was reading this stuff nonsense on Facebook all of I declare this. I own this. I, they speak what they think. They become miniature gods because that's what metaphysics is. And what they believe is that in the beginning, Adam had that capability, and that capability never left humanity. They just need to exercise that. The Bible doesn't teach that you become a miniature God and you can speak whatever you want into existence. I declare, I've heard a preacher here in San Antonio tell a whole audience the first week of January for New Year's, how many of you want to be prosperous and be healthy this year? Everybody raising their hand. I declare that for you. And you know, people getting sick, going into poverty, losing their jobs. You can't, you're not a little God. You can't tell God what to do. You don't lay down a railroad track and say, hey, God, I'm going to declare this and you are obligated to do this. That's not biblical at all. The Bible says if we pray according to his will, so all true prayer originates in heaven. God burns us with his will. How? Through his word. Here's God. Here's his word. As we read it, he burdens us, and then we pray that back to him, and then he fulfills the desires of our heart. God doesn't do it in round, like a lot of these people claim. Through dreams, through prophecy, through so-called experiences. You know one of the only problems that I've always had with Charismatics and Pentecostals? They're always trying to outdo one another's experience. And so I, was, I meet a guy and he's had, he said he got baptized, he's spoken in tongues, and now he's back drinking again. So now what he's got to go seek? See, now he becomes very disenfranchised. He, he becomes very discouraged because why didn't it work continuously? Where was the power? And they start questioning God, which is what Satan wants. Well, they never got on the right track to begin with. So if your churches were teaching you good, it's really very simple. You put your trust in Christ. The Bible says in Romans 12, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so you may prove what the will of God is. Jesus tells us how to be his disciple. Okay, we walk in the Spirit by faith, not by sight, not by feelings. And we study to show ourselves approved as a workman who need not be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. We become students of God's word. So God doesn't do it in round that a lot of people claim. I have people, I had this dream. I got this problem. Oh, these people have a prophet. Trump's going to be president. God told me that. Well, now all of a sudden they're wrong. You don't hear from them anymore. Okay? You had this thing, uh, Q. Then they were doing all kind of crazy and saying things. And people, I heard a preacher here pronouncing that, oh, the moons are all lining up, and now all of a sudden God's going to do something supernatural in 2021. It didn't happen. So what happened? The Old Testament, the, the, the rule was, if you prophesy something that doesn't get true, come true, you're stoned to death. Yet you got all these so-called prophets going, and now they talk about, and suddenly they take, they don't understand biblical language, so they take terms out, like Logos, Rima. And they say, they try to make it sound like, oh, but God has given us a different word apart from his word. It's spiritually discerned in a supernatural metaphysical sense that most people won't understand. And that's not true at all. 
God relishes the faith of a little child who can come to God, believe in his promises, and rest on them. Deliverance Ministries. It's another big con. By the way, most of these charismatics, here you go up there and you look at they see them on television with all this excessive makeup, jewelry, elaborate stages. You know, they live in mansions, drive jets. And you don't have enough common sense to recognize that that picture is all wrong. Nobody that is humble and truly understands the grace of God would spend that kind of money on themselves. You know, you were to give me a million dollars, what do you think I'd do with it? You know, I'll probably build churches and Bible schools and, you know, I, I, if somebody asks me, hey Manny, you need a car? Yeah, I do, I really do need a car. Do you want an experience or you just want A to B? I says, well, I would like an experience, you know, but I'll settle with A to B. And that's what I got. Manny, you want a real lavish apartment? Yeah, I would like that. But I'll settle for a roof over my head. Manny, you want really nice clothes? Yeah, I really would. I wear mostly t-shirts. and I haven't bought hardly any clothes for me in years. You know, I go down to, uh, oh, use clothes place. You know, or if I play in a tournament, they give me shirts like in tennis or golf. You know, and that's fine. I don't need to look like the world, okay? I'm satisfied with that. Well, you have these people, they get up there and they have this idea of prosperity, wealth, and health, and all that. And you have the average guy that looks at that, or gal, and either they're wanting that like the world does, or it turns them off, you know? Now, you have... Satan, and you have this deliverance ministry now that has come on the scene about delivering believers from demonic possession. Possession means ownership. Let me, let me explain this to you real quickly. You have unbelievers and believers. The way Satan in the world gets to unbelievers is internally. Because all they, they have a fallen nature. They don't have a new nature. So that fallen nature can be appealed to. And that, what do you think advertisers do? You know, they put a scantily clad woman on. And they may have absolutely nothing to do with the product. Because they know that men are physically attracted. And so they do stuff like that. And then that internal, what Satan tries to do is take ownership, which is possession. Possession. Who took possession of me the minute I got saved? Jesus did. I was transferred over to him. He gave me his nature. And sealed me with the Holy Spirit, whether you like that or not. And gave me gifts. According to his determination, not mine. You know? Believers, how does he get, how did the enemy get to us? Externally, not internally. Satan cannot read your mind. He doesn't have that ability. Oh, the devil told me that. The devil whispered that in my ear. That's nonsense. You may have heard that on television or from your so-called ungodly friends. Or if you're going fooling around with stuff like astrology and horoscopes and Ouija boards and uh, all these different portals of entrance to demonic things, he can get inside of you that way. But he can't do it internally. He always does it externally because he's trying to influence you to do evil. That's what a lot of these false teachers do. So you get this guy like uh, oh, Kenneth Hagin and Kenyon who get into metaphysics, which is lies, and then they take those lies and they transfer them over to Christianity and they take that to its what they call their natural application. And that's how they come up with these word of faith, say it, name it, and claim it, to speak what you want in reality into existence. 
very arrogant. I hear people say that or writing that on Facebook and I just, who do they think they are anyway? Let me read to you Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. It says, your attitude should be the same, verse 5, your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourself. So it's a whole different thing from being and looking to see what you can get as a way, as opposed to you getting out of the way. Again, most of the Pentecostals, Charismatics, even Catholic Charismatics, Word of Faith movement, they're looking for them. You know, all you have to do is look at their lifestyles so or look what they're praying for. Okay? He says, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. This attitude should be the same as yours as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. There you go. He set himself aside. It's called a hypostatic union, who God took on humanity and suffered and experience every kind of temptation that we have without giving in. He said he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. That's what God wants us to do, is to make ourselves nothing, not to make ourselves something. Because when you make yourself nothing, he says, and being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death. He didn't want to go to the cross. He said, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. Yet he was obedient. And you think about what Christ's obedience brought him. It didn't bring him health, wealth, and prosperity. It brought him the cross. That's what happens to the disciples. It happened to all the apostles. Every one of them died by martyr, except for John. And they tried to kill him. They finally exiled him on the island of Patmos. He became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, a God exalted him. Now, when you get out of the way, you die to self, you give up everything, you put the Lord Jesus Christ first in all your relationships, then his power, his purpose, and his will will be accomplished through you. Not in you seeking some kind of experiential experience, which is never really enough anyway for them, okay, and trying to get something or somebody that you already have. It's stupid, okay. Again, at the heart of all the Pentecostal, charismatic, word of faith movement is narcissism, okay. In Revelation 3, Jesus says we were going to come to such a time as this, that people think they're rich, they have no need of nothing, and they have been deceived. That's through their true spiritual condition. I know all these people that think they're super spiritual. So much so, they think they're more spiritual than God and can do the things of God. And that's what Satan's downfall was. He wasn't content with what he had. He didn't have the attitude, it is enough. And Jesus says, if your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you should be content with that. You know? But these people that are looking themselves to be heroes and some kind of uh, super Christian uh, figure, entertainers and all that, it's, it's, it's not too long before they fall into the true snares of the devil, as we see over the ages. You know, I think about that widow woman who gave all she had, poor, to the Lord Jesus Christ without any flamboyance, without any attention. That's the kind of woman that I admire. But these people, these believers, and they get up there and they show off all their luxury and different things and they brag about all the things they can do. God couldn't be more greedy. They're just like the Pharisees. 
which group do you want to belong to? Now, I always say this when I'm talking to, I could, I could go into deep exegetical, uh, biblical reasons more. It would take a long time. That's why I tell people, look, the best thing you can do is do like I did 50 years ago. And that is undertake a study of pneumatology. Try to really understand who the Holy Spirit is. Try to really understand what God has given you at the moment of salvation. Understand your timeline as to what God is doing at different times. Not only in your life, but also in the ages. Okay? Greatest thing you can do if, if you want to be really used of God is to find out His purpose and plan for your life according to His will as He sensitizes you to His Word and He speaks to you to His Word in a little historical grammatical fashion where you don't take it out of context. And you begin to understand what His purpose is for the church and where your part is in the body. That's where you're going to be fruitful, people. I'm so thankful for the godly people in my life and all the ones that trained me over the years, Dr. Howard Hendricks, Dr. Elsie Fix, all the ones that personally invested their lives into my life so that I could be uh, a useful servant of the Lord. And, and when I'm not, to know how to come to God and confess my sin so that he can restore the fellowship. And at the end of our lives, when we look back, how do you want to look back on it? You know, humble or proud? Arrogant, you know, or useful? It's all up to you. I always tell people, especially young people, you get out of life what you put into it. You get out of life what you really want. Who do you really want to follow? You know, you want to follow Lord Jesus Christ? Go to Philippians 2. Okay, see the kind of people that God brags about in the Bible. Read Hebrews 11 and see Hebrews 12. Read about this widow woman. Read about the people that God, he says, he says, I'm not, in, I'm not, I'm, I'm not impressed with the strength of the legs of a horse or that of a man. I'm impressed by those who trust me. Day in and day out, when it looks like everything is falling apart. That's the thing that pleases God, is faith. Faith in that little child, like my Uncle Augustine, his little son there, praying, looking at his dad in that chair, struggling to survive. And praying that his dad would get up and walk, yet still believing, even though his dad does not. When we get to heaven someday, we're going to see those things that will really impress God. God bless you all. Listen, you got a lot of questions and arguments about this? Private message me. Don't put it publicly, because I'll just delete them. And the reason for that is because there's a lot of believers out there that, that listen to my posts and so forth, and, and they're looking for answers, and they may read something or take it out of context or it gets misconstrued in their mind somehow, and now you have caused them to stumble greatly. And I don't want to participate or be a part of that, okay? You got your church, you got your pastors, uh, listen, it, 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 but the best thing you got is you got, you're a believer, you got the Holy Spirit in you, you got the Word of God. You're empowered. You're rich. Go to those sources. God bless you all. Have a great day.